Thinking in Dark Times is a podcast series by Ukraine World, a website in English about Ukraine. Our guest today is Svetoslav Vakarchuk, a Ukrainian rock star, the leader of the rock band Okean Elzy, and one of Ukraine's most popular modern musicians. Vakarchuk is also a civic activist and formerly a politician who founded the political party Holos. My name is Volodymyr Yermolenko, I'm Ukrainian philosopher and Ukraine World's chief editor. I spoke to Svetoslav Vakarchuk about Ukrainian culture, the country's fight for freedom, music on the front line, Ukraine's difference from Russia, and the deep roots of the Ukrainian resistance. Explaining Ukraine is a podcast by ukraineworld.org, a website in English about Ukraine, brought to you by Internews Ukraine. You can support us on patreon.com slash ukraineworld. You can also support our humanitarian trips to the frontline areas at paypal, ukraine.resisting.gmail.com. Svetoslav Vakarchuk, welcome to this podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me here. So you're one of the most famous Ukrainian musicians and uh, you're a person very important for this country. Did you did you learn something new about this country during the past year? Something that you didn't know? My honest answer will be no, not really. It means that I knew a lot of the things that other people were caught by surprise with these things. So I, I, I've been learning them since well, I was a kid, maybe because I'm inquisitive, so I'm trying to to see the things. Maybe because I'm brought up, I was brought up and raised in Western Ukraine and Lviv, which in fact was from the very beginning of Ukrainian independence and even beyond. Uh, it was a stronghold of Ukraine, U- Ukrainianess if I may say this word. And uh, I just learned, uh, maybe I I learned something that I didn't know, that Ukrainians are not only uh, people who rely on themselves rather than on the central power, but they can also organize and horizontally in a very very good way and i saw it in my in my dan but i in both both my dance but i i thought it was more a feature of you know a passionate minority uh if may i may say intellectual or um, patriotic elite of the country but what actually i learned new is that the whole country including those who were sometimes very reluctant to participate in Ukrainian national building, appeared to be very self-organized in a horizontal way, in a horizontal level. That's also what I, I would agree with you, because, I mean, we all knew that Ukraine has a core, that, you know, there is intelligentsia, there is culture actors, there are, there are writers, there are musicians, there are civil activists. But during these events, I think from 2014, we understood that Ukraine is much deeper than that, that many, many people uh, have this country under their veins, right? So it's, it's like their instinct. It's not about ideas. It's not about concepts. It's, about, it's not about, you know, theoretical some principles. It's about instincts of freedom. This is what nation, uh, especially political nation, is about. What, because I think we started building this nation uh, as a political nation, uh, not at the moment when, uh, let's say, a group of prominent intellectuals uh, raised the topic of Ukraine in the world or started, you know, communicated it or communicating it or discussing it with each other, like what is it to be Ukraine, what is national idea. But I think that political nation started to build the moment that the whole uh, ethnic nation, or I would say all inhabitants of this land, uh, started to get involved in, in, in into this discussion. So I may say, I may say we were unlucky that we didn't have our state before, but the lucky part was that, in my opinion, we invisibly, during hundreds of years, uh, had been left alone not in a not in a political way suddenly we were parts of 
uh, empire, especially last time of uh, very brutal and awful Russian and Soviet empire. But generally, people in Moscow, they they didn't, they didn't give a damn about real, uh, you know, Ukrainians. And they, I think, uh, lost uh, this self-esteem or maybe this uh, creation uh, of DNA of Ukrainians. And it became so strong that it couldn't be uh, expelled or evaporated with, or exterminated it would, by Stalin, by Lenin, by Tsars before, by Putin, by whoever. And, and I think uh, had they been more precise, Russians, I mean, uh, and more uh, pragmatic in wiping, wiping out Ukrainians from Ukrainians, they would probably... Uh, they, w- they, they, w- they would be successful and maybe they would get rid of Ukraine as a concept. But because they did everything as Russians always do, you know, 50-50, uh, we were lucky. And I think at the moment of uh, tipping point, this DNA or this instincts started to work for us. And that's what, what, what we are witnessing right now. Yeah, this is this is what uh, actually inspires me. Is that when I hear, for example, some of the people saying that Maidan was a revolution of middle class, I say, wait, wait, wait. Uh, it's it's much deeper than that. It's it's not only about middle class. It's about you cannot build nations just with middle class. Exactly, uh, yes. you cannot. You you need something deeper. Okay, in, in Russia you have probably middle class, which is you know liberal and anti-Putin, but we see that always was. Is, uh, Remember, I don't know how you how you how they say it in English, uh, the decabrists. Yeah, decembrists. 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 Yeah, in 1825, when they they actually were very pro-Western people, but 95 percent of Russians didn't understand them. And they didn't understand the Russians. And this is the problem that we are facing now with our northern neighbor, who has appeared to be the bitter enemy now of Ukraine, that they, even those civilized or enlightened Russians, they cannot change anything, not only because they're weak or they are a minority, they don't know how to talk to their own people. And this is their problem, and unfortunately this is our problem, because Putin knows how to talk to their people, and he talks to their people the way that they become bitter enemies of us and they're coming to our land to destroy and to kill and to rape. And sadly, uh, we fight back and, uh, and it will be a long story for us. And I think this kind of belligerence of, of Russians comes not from the fact that they you know, are so strong warriors or something, Spartans, no. It comes from the thing that there is nothing else their leaders can give them, which is tangible and which is which can be, you know, trans, transposed to to their well-being or something. The only thing they know how to sell is to sell the conquering of new world, of new uh, new, new new lands, of subjugating uh, and 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 all these kind of things. And uh, and Ukrainians, uh, Ukrainians, the difference of Ukrainians is that. Ukrainians had small, uh, a smaller lead. Our lead was tiny, but uh, basic people, call them, I don't know, uh, farmers or peasants, call them blue colors, you name it. They all had this kind of Ukrainian gene and uh, Ukrainian president, whoever he or she is, can talk to the, know how to talk to the people so they understand. And uh, and and we and that's our strength, I think. Yeah, I think the what Ukrainians expect from the leaders is to be uh, one of us. This is Absolutely. probably this is probably the the reasons of success of Zelensky. Yeah, I agree. That he actually built this idea. I uh, agree. As f- as far as Russia is concerned, uh, I'm always saying this provocative thought that there is Russian nationalism, but there is no Russian nation. Nation as an organism, as a subject, which actually can uh, uh, can rebel it, against very, the sovereign. It's very simple, uh, because Russia is one of the last empires, and empires didn't have nations. Empires had sovereigns. There was 
long time ago, no French nation, no English nation, no German nation. There was no Italian nation. There were part times that they had these smaller uh, fiefdoms. They had bigger, you know, kind of kingdoms and all kind of things. And they were all subject of, uh, of, of the crown, this or that. And nobody thought about themselves as a nation. It started to become uh, a point and a sound point when, when people started to feel each other and understanding each other. And, uh, and and building horizontal uh, horizontal you know ties connections and interactions and I think the Russia still haven't got it I mean they still haven't got to the point when no, there is not uh, there is somebody else but let's say sovereign who brings this uh, national identity and and you can see it you know uh, there are some nations in the world that manage to build political nations in a very amalgamatic in a very uh, striped in a very you know kind of different uh, n- ethnical soup if i may say one of them is the united states of america t- to some extent britain and france uh, as former colonies so they build they they build their ideas and nations on the principles on constitution on the values on the on the way of living you know and uh, Mm, Russia cannot do it because they don't have a single concept. I was struck by interview of one of uh, liberators of Kherson region who then told in the interview the stories other people who were under occupation were telling him that when the Russians came, they actually, they knew how to conquer, but when they came, they, did, they had a zero clue what to do next. They had... You know, they didn't have a plan. They didn't have a strategy. They didn't have an idea they want to sell to these poor people that that left under the occupation. So all they had is fear, and then so it's a very very old school, if I may say, concept. And nobody can build anything sustainable uh, today just building on the concepts of fear. Yes, the, the, the tyrannies are based on the on the fear, yeah. right? And uh, therefore, they are based on violence. I think the problem of Russia is that they understand in a certain way that violence is the only instrument. Absolutely, have, right? I, I uh, maybe it's a good good place to to present this concept. I always thought about Russia um, as a like their empire, as of uh, you know, imagine. Uh, a big, obese, fat uh, person, won't name the gender, you imagine, uh, who is in, uh, on the lake or in the river, uh, which is frozen uh, and standing on the ice. But it's almost spring. And then finally, uh, this person understands that ice starts cracking. And actually, the only way for him or her to survive is and, and and he or she is heavy so when you stay sooner or later you'll go down you know, under the water so the only way for you to succeed is to run just to run when you run quick enough it will be no uh, not not so much pressure on the ice and ice probably will somehow will uh, still uh, hold you and and the moment they stop they go down. Moreover, because it's spring, the ice gets thinner and thinner and thinner. Sooner or later, they will go down. And just uh, the the one thing you can do is just to to further to extend your the, the moment when you go down. So Russia doesn't have so so. Imagine this running is conquering other lands. So this only thing expanding, expanding, running, running. The moment they settle down, start thinking about sustainable model. They understand they are too big, they are too diverse, uh, they are uh, too far f- from each other subjects. They are they don't have strong concept contrary to, for example, I don't know, uh, China where is language or culture, or America where is root uh, uh, rules, constitution or principles. They don't have anything. And then uh, language, no, I don't think that people in uh, uh, Chechnya. Or people in uh, Chukotka, uh, they really think the Russian is 
uh, real, their mother tongue. And when you go to, to remote parts of uh, Far East, especially on the border of China, there are, some people say there are more Chinese now there than, than people of Slavic origin. I've been to Blagoveshinsk uh, a long time ago when we still were touring there, so I remember that. I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's scary. And, uh, and that's what they are trying to do. They're running, running, running. Uh, but the problem of us uh, is that it hurts us. And so the only thing now we need to focus is how to get rid of this problem and come to how to win the war and then to make sure that, uh, mm, let's say, the problem of our northern neighbor doesn't become our problem anymore. You talked very, uh, very well about these horizontal ties, right? And I think that this is the role of culture, actually, starting from the 19th century, when Ukraine didn't have a state. This is this enigma of Taras Shevchenko. Actually, what Shevchenko told to Ukrainians is that you can survive without a Tsar. You can survive without sovereign. You are Ukrainians, even though you don't have a state. Do you have the impression that music, for example, the music that you are creating, you have been creating over the past several decades, was also kind of this glue that that helped people understand each other? Because I know that many of your fans were actually rediscovering Ukraine thanks to your songs. Uh, first, uh, re reflecting on your uh, the first far part of your of your question. I, I do think that culture is a very strong glue and, and cement for, for, for building this house of, of the nation. Uh, and uh, I also think that generally ideas, what culture is an abstract thing, so it's ideas by Plato. So ideas are much more sustainable and much more, uh, they can survive more than material things. So uh, when you build an empire, you you impose the laws, you 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 put you know your your buildings, your army. Some it's it's a strong thing for empires. But if somebody has culture like language, songs, poetry, uh, generally idea, like Jewish had like you know Torah for two thousand years, it keeps you together even without having any state. So this is, the, uh, in the Bible you say, uh, I don't remember the, how, how it says exactly in English, but it's at the beginning, the word was at the beginning, the logo, you know? So, and I think that this logo, uh, logo is a very powerful concept, very abstract as anything that human beings create, but it lasts for, for a long time. And uh, I think it helped Ukrainians. And suddenly I tried to use Ukrainian language as a very important tool for my music because uh, I not, not only I, I, I do music, I actually consider myself a musician, first of all. So I can write music even without, you know, lyrics or no songs like recently I've written um, um, uh, score, musical score for Bernard Henri Lévy, a film about Ukraine. So I love it. But words uh, and your language gives, makes your, your arts even more powerful because it, it gives to, the, to all these people the idea of that they are together. So this is something that that unites them. Like when I go to the to the to the front line, I just came yesterday evening from 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 different places. I've been to near Siversk, I've been near, uh, near Bakhmut and other places. So all soldiers, uh, even though even those that probably big part of them are not fans of Fakir Nelze or my music. They like hearing them because it gives them an idea that these songs are their songs. They own it somehow. It's not American or certainly not Russian songs or not Polish songs. These are their Ukrainian songs. And maybe that sounds sort of nationalistic, but this is the first or second stage of nation buildings. All nations which uh, start building political nations come through this kind of... Mm, genuine or primary primary stage of nationalism, uh, both in a bad but in a good in a good way of this meaning, and uh, 
And I think Ukrainian songs and our songs, okay, and other songs play this role. And yeah, I, I agree with you. And there is one more thing about these songs that you sing together with somebody. So it's uh, it's a great difference with the symphonical music or with just playing the piano. I'm also mm-hmm. a pi- mm-hmm. pianist, so but I don't sing, right? And I kind of envy people who can sing, who can create songs. Why? Because these songs immediately started to be sung by others and you have this community and i i do think that the the fact that ukrainian literature was actually surviving in the form of songs not in in the form of written literature and then ukrainian romantics what they do first they collected the songs Mm -hmm. and then uh you might say that what shevchenko was trying to do is to yeah yeah, recreate the song music or the folk music there is this this concept that you sing together that you 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 don't sing on your by yourself. Yeah, that that that's correct. And uh, there are many nations uh, uh, in the world who survived because of music, because of the songs. Think of Ireland. Uh, I think like music and dance and songs are like you know, it's 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 just what they are. You know. Uh, it's it's very 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 concrete thing when when it makes brings them together. Uh, I've been to Morocco, and uh, as you know, there are um, the biggest biggest national identities. There are uh, Arabs, but also Berbers, uh, and Berbers they are uh, original people from from there. And they have different language, different culture, and they have a lot of songs. And they, they, they do this. They they sing. They have they they have their culture of songs. And I think it's part of uh, uh, it's 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 an intuitive desire to survive, and it's very powerful. Ukrainians did the same, and do the same, and uh, and I think yeah, it's 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 really very important. It's also easier to transfer uh, your ideas through the songs and music than just through spoken uh, arts. Uh, that's why maybe Ukrainians uh, developed such a strong folk culture of, of uh, folk traditional music, and maybe not so big. Uh, I may I may condemn some uh, somebody maybe um, uh, a sort of. Uh, uh, ab- abused by thing, by, by this, but I, I don't want to abuse somebody. But I think that in 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 a spoken language, like in literature and poetry, Ukraine is not as diverse, as strong, and as in 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 the songs, uh, we have great poets, and especially now. But that was not a signature of Ukrainian nations. Like the songs were the signature of Ukrainian nations. You know, that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, and country, songs- for example, to French, who always were had a lot of you know. Uh, poets uh, and they liked it and it was part of their of their culture but for ukraine i think songs are and an- another element of songs is that uh, you use all your body right to to produce it you sing and sometimes you dance it's yeah, not like you literature play, play, you play, play instruments yeah yeah and and this is also very interesting uh look are you are you are you proud of the contemporary Ukrainian music? Uh, because I'm proud of it, and I always try to advise it to others. And I will tell you one thing that I think why Ukrainian contemporary music, rock, pop, jazz, whatever, rap, is interesting. Uh, there are many people who try to combine tradition and modernity, like create very modern, technically modern music, but go deep with uh, with traditions, with folk traditions, etc., would you agree with that? It's not. E- it's this is not an easy question. Uh, what I certainly agree with is that that now we have a revival or a boom of Ukrainian uh, modern culture, contemporary culture, music, um, poetry, even films, and all you know all these kind of things. So. Uh, 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 we have a lot of artists, a lot of musicians, everybody, like you know. So the like, you know, creative world now is is is, is uh, blooming and bur- and burgeoning. Uh, but uh, but also mm, there is a side effect of that. 
uh, when something is, you know, is is on the run, uh, then there are a lot of people who try to be part of that without actually uh, feeling it, just wanting to be, you know, in, in trend. And, and uh, we should be very careful in, you know, creating a lot of songs about war because it's because that's what people want. We we should be very careful in in uh, transferring arts into propaganda, into uh, leaflets, into you know, kind of these kind of things. Because I see the signs of that. Uh, for every for every genius song which I hear, and there are plenty of them. I also hear three or four songs which probably were written by in in 15 minutes by somebody who just got great play of words or just said and wanted to say something like in the news like the tv pre presenters so we need to be very careful i'm not i'm not uh valuing any of that because i just trying uh, uh to keep very neutral all the time i'm i'm only trying to value myself uh, so it's not in my tradition to say bad words about other people but I feel sometimes that it's not 100% real or art artistic emotions sometimes it's, it's it's like you know I want to be part of a crowd so we need, we need to be yeah, I'm, I'm also careful about the songs about the war actually I didn't I didn't hear many many good songs about the war but I I, I would rather say about you know the general trend that you Generally, take the yes. folk the, the folk music and you try to you know rethink it and reform it right? generally yes because uh finally after years or maybe or maybe decades or even or even centuries of uh being oppressed now we have time to be our own and to be who are, who we want to be and 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 it you know comes out of of the deep and it uh Erects as a as a real big thing. You travel a lot to the front line, and you give concerts there. You you play music to the soldiers. You you talk to them. What do you see there? What what do they tell you? Why I'm asking this? Because, I mean, even sitting in Kiev, you don't really feel right now. You don't really feel the war. No. Uh, if you go there to these places, it's just a completely different reality, completely Absolutely. different space, completely different landscape, completely different faces. And uh, but still, in Kiev, people talk about this war. When you go outside to Poland, to America, mm -hmm. to France, well, the war is just an abstract word for them, right? It's okay. I mean, what would you expect? Uh, this is the nature of a game. Uh, there were a lot of wars during the last 30 years. None of them was as big uh, and maybe very few were as cruel as the one, this one. But there were a lot of wars. And let's say Ukrainians were not you know, so much you know, interested in that. Like, uh, like, you know, absolutely awful barbaric genocide in, in, in Rwanda and uh, places that were happening in in, in uh, earlier in places like Cambodia and others. So Iran-Iraq war, uh, like it was 70s in the 80s. So yes, uh, people feel something that uh, has connection with them. Americans were talking and discussing and um, feeling Vietnam war because that's, it, it was their war. And... Uh, so suddenly are Ukrainians now and uh, our closer neighbors like Baltic countries and Poles, they, they, they really th talk and think about this war, not in an abstract way because they're scared, because they understand that Ukrainians, they understand not in an abstract you know, terms, but, but in a practical um, terms that Ukraine now is fighting for their future as well. But but yes, generally, people uh, for other people, this is a war from headlines, and the the one thing that makes it so the message so powerful is that the heroism and absolutely uns, unseen 
resilience uh, with which Ukrainians fight against so-called second army in the world and uh, the country which considered what was considered to be like a huge superpower. So we are actually now uh, we are declassing this superpower right in the eyes of the whole world. That's why I think the world is so excited about Ukraine. It's not only because it's the war in Europe, not only because we are fighting for democracy, but also because we are winning, you know, and, 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 and there is, uh, there, are, there are no many, no more, uh, not, not a lot, uh, such powerful conceptions like a concept, concepts like a concept of uh, David against Goliath, you know, and 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 everybody, you know, everybody is supporting David, and everybody's a fan of David, you know. But at the same time, when I when I go and and uh, talk to soldiers, uh, I feel that you know, well, of course there is heroism and and, and like this image of people of steel, but th- they are not people of steel. No. they are real people from Absolutely. flesh. They are Absolutely. they are also tired from this war. Absolutely. They are they have they have fear. They. Are, I feel right. this kind of a fatigue, and I think I think we we also need to talk about this, right? And not just think, okay, there are some cyborgs or keyboards on the front line who can do any everything, and uh, we will just rely on them. But uh, I don't disagree with you. But but what is interesting that the fatigue is individual play thing, but when you talk about collective thing, there is no collective fatigue in Ukraine. So. Oh. We see soldiers who, as human beings, are really tired. They are tired. They are sometimes having concussions. They have uh, they're wounded. They don't sleep a lot. So they really need need rest, both physical and mental. But if you talk about the army as a whole or the nation as a whole, I don't see that that the army or the nation are. Is tired, you know, as a big organism, like you know, le- le- as a le- le- leviathan, you know. So, so, uh, so this is a strange phenomenon, and I think it's a very good thing. It would be very dangerous if the nation fatigue was present, but I so far don't don't feel it. Do you when you when you talk to soldiers from the very first months and and now do you have do you feel some changes? The way how you they they talk to you, the the way how they behave, the way how they look. They became more confident. Uh, uh, March and April, it was more desperate thing, like really, uh, three hundred Spartans, you know this kind of feeling. Now, uh, it's more, they are tired, but they are also confident. They they experienced, especially the commanders, the officers. They experienced. They know what to do. Uh, two days ago, I was uh, near Siversk, and I talked to a uh, one of the uh, uh, commanders of uh, the uh, brigade commander, and he told me, "Look, we know what we're doing. Uh, it's it's hard. Russians are pressing. They have a strong, you know, kind of." They are, they are strong because there are a lot of them and they have a lot of ammunition and a lot of men and everything and they're pressing. It's not a piece of cake. It's very difficult. But we know what to do. And uh, they say, we control the situation. And sooner or later, we got to kick him out. That's kind of... I see it. So they don't look like desperate. They look like tired, but, you know, it's like a driver. When you're tired already, you drive a lot, but you know where you're going, you know that you'll be there. Do you think that we should be preparing for a long war? Yes, without any doubt. Because, I mean, there are talks that it will, it might end this year. I don't uh, think it might end I, this year. I will be, I want to be, uh, I don't like to be wrong. I am sort of one of these people who always like to win, but I will be the happiest man in the world if I'm wrong with my prediction but my prediction is that this year this war is not gonna end this year and i think our listeners and if i'm wrong i will say i was wrong and i'm happy i think our listeners uh, should also you know hear this because there is lots of talk that okay if ukraine doesn't win this year 
the West will change its tactics. I think we should be preparing it again. It can be like a black swan, and everything will end this year. But we should be preparing for a long fight. Absolutely, and I will tell you even more. Uh, the truth is that even the West uh, drops the support uh, and uh, you know stops doing anything. We still will fight, and we still will not lose. And I understand that. We prob- it will be probably much more difficult for us and the price will be even higher. But I don't think the Ukrainians are going to give up, even without Western support. The g- and, and I think this is part of the thing that West should understand. And I think that little by little politicians there understand that they not only help us because they want us to win as soon as possible, but also they know that if they don't help us, We'll still be there fighting, fighting forever, you know, and they don't want this war to be forever. I think they want to end it as soon as possible as other people as well, and as ours certainly. And they understand that the only good impact and the only impact that that will, you know, kind of make this war in the, like, you know, left in the past will be the significant victory, if you will. The West was actually Europe, both Europe and America, were built on the idea of warriors. I mean, you cannot imagine Europe without these medieval ages, knights, you know, chivalrous culture. You cannot also imagine the United States with this idea of a you know individual who is armed, who is able to protect himself or herself. And then gradually this idea was lost, was lost, right? Because you are living in a welfare state, there is a police which will protect you, there is NATO which will protect you, security is taken for granted. Ukrainian experience shows us that security and freedom should not be taken for granted, you should always be prepared to defend them. Do you have the impression that within our partners in Europe and America there is also change of mind? Yes. Yes, I think that there is this change of mind. It's not only the the welfare, but also a deliberate uh, choice that uh, Europeans did in made in their ed- education and the world that people should be peaceful, uh, the compromise should be a stronger weapon than the real weapon, the negotiations, trying to make everybody happy. So the idea of a non-zero-sum game was pre- dominant in the world for, uh, since uh, since 1945, right? But the problem is that there are nations or there are players who want to play this zero-sum game, like Russia. Not only Russia, but just I think Iran is one of these kind of... Uh, not China. I think China is... Uh, I think they are much more practical and much... I think Russia is playing a negative sum game. Uh, it's like, The lose-lose game. I hope so. But they are trying to make, you know, like just to put everything on, on the row or on the other, like, you know, pull all the chips on, on one, on one, uh, you know, uh, field. And, and, and this is something that was common many years ago. In fact, Russia is doing a very, once again, they're a very old school politically country. They're still living in the patterns of 19th, 18th, 17th, or maybe 12th, I would say even 12th century. You know, and, uh, and this is their weakness, but it's also our problem because this is a nuclear state with enormous territory, a lot of people, and, and, and a dictator who's crazy. You know, so, so this is not only their problem. It's, it's actually the problem of the whole world and especially of the neighbors like Ukraine. But look, Ukraine is, for them, is like a let's say, a special place. And they are so crazy to to get it and to take it over. But look, they are thinking all the time about Moldova. They talk even now about Georgia, after especially things that are happening. They, they are expansionists. Once again, remember my allegory about this fat man running on that thin ice. They're running, running, running. They're so freaking out that the moment they stop, they will go down under the water. Let's maybe talk a little bit about Ukraine, about Ukrainian politics, uh, because you're also a politician. Or Used you were, to be. You were Used a politician, yes. 
but you founded a party which was quite successful and is quite successful in the parliament. But the problem of the politics is that, especially after the victory, is that you know during the war there is tragedies, there is pain, but everything is clear, as you said. Black you know, and white. You, you, know, you, you know where your enemy it's is. It's black and white, yeah. And you, you are good, the enemy is bad. Uh, peace is much more complicated. And uh, actually Ukrainians had always problems with, with the peaceful lives, with agreeing between themselves. Do you think we will, uh, we will overcome this kind of... A, uh, a little bit uh, infantilic uh, version of our society and will be able to consolidate even when there is, you know, let's hope that the, the external enemy is not there. Imagine that you are a family, like, you know, driving the car or, I don't know, being somewhere and you caught in an accident, a very, very awful accident and... And actually, as a family, you had issues, you know, you were not uh, super happy, uh, like, you know, with strong bonds family, you had arguments all the time, kids and wife and, and a husband, but you certainly loved each other deep in, in your heart. But, but, you know, it was always, oh no, it's a nightmare to be together once again, all the time, you know, this argument. But then you got... You, you 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 face a real threat. I don't know an accident, or somebody's going to kill you, all of you, or you know taking hostages or something. So the moment you you feel it, you don't think about your discrepancies. You don't think about your differences. You just need to win the situation. You need to survive. And then when you become really a family, that's what happened with Ukraine. So when everything is over. You will never forget this, uh, this tragic but also heroic and hopefully successful uh, experience. And yes, you sooner or later you'll come back to things as usual, but not as usual the same way. They will be different. And I think the war will help Ukrainians to be uh, stronger as a peaceful as a nation uh, during the peace times. We still will be will be arguments. I think I think the politics will once again be will be tricky and there will be shades of gray. But I don't think we will come back to the um, point zero any uh, any time like in the future. I think after we win the war, we'll be different. We'll never be the same again. I've written a song about that, and it's actually uh, the hat, you know, kind of the. The main, the main, the main theme, the main song of this movie of Bahmar Henry Levy. It says, uh, the lyric says, like in in the chorus, "We'll never be, we'll never be, we'll never be the same. We've had it all, the perfect storm, the fire and the flames. We've reached the sky, we crossed the line, the point of no return. We'll never be, we'll never be, we'll never be the same again." Svetoslav Kachuk, thank you very much for this conversation. Thank you. Looks nice. This was a podcast series, Thinking in Dark Times, by Ukraine World, a website in English about Ukraine. The goal of this series is to make Ukraine and the current war a focal point of our common reflection about the world's present, past and future. We try to see light through and despite the current darkness. You can support us on patreon.com slash Ukraine world. You can support also our volunteer trips to the frontline areas at PayPal, ukraine.resisting.gmail.com. Stay with us and stand with Ukraine.